Welcome to today's industry and campus webinar, Building Terracotta, a platform for conducting randomized controlled experiments in the LMS. This is Jason Martin, online event producer at Educause. Educause is pleased to welcome today's speakers, Ben Motes, Anye Paku, and Patty Wolf. I'll introduce them in just a moment, but first let me give you a brief orientation on our session's learning environment. We hope you'll join us in making the session interactive. To open the chat, please click on the chat icon at the bottom of the presentation window. You can use the chat to make comments, share resources, or to pose questions to our presenters. Be sure to select panelists and attendees, or everyone, from the drop-down menu to engage with all participants. We'll save some time for Q&A at the end of the presentation, but we encourage you to type your questions into the chat throughout the webinar. If you have any technical issues, please direct a private message by selecting panelists in the chat dropdown. The session recording and slides will be archived later today on the Educause website. And now let's turn to our presentation. One of the most urgent questions in education research is what kinds of learning activities improve student success? Unfortunately, even with terabytes of data gushing out of our e-learning systems, we will still have trouble in inferring what works. This is because relationships between learning activities and student success are just correlational. A learning activity might cause students to succeed, but it's also possible that successful students are just more likely to engage in the learning activity. To identify what works, we need more data. We need to be able to conduct experiments. In today's session, we will describe our vision for enabling teachers and researchers to easily run experiments in their classes and will unveil Terracotta, an experiment builder that integrates with the Canvas Learning Management System, the product of a collaboration between Unicon and Indiana University. Today's speakers are Ben Motes, who research scientist at Indiana University, Anya Paku, a program director at the Learning Agency Lab, and Patty Wolf, Senior Director, Applications, Integrations, and Data at Unicon. And with that, let's begin today's industry and campus webinar, Building Terracotta, a platform for conducting randomized controlled experiments in the LMS. Ben, over to you. Thank you so much, Jason. And thank you all for joining. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thanks to um, Unicon for kind of giving this platform for us to share with you, Terracotta. So um, we're gonna go ahead and get started with a few polls, some questions to kind of get a feeling for each other and for the purpose of today. So um, Jason, if you could go ahead and activate the first poll. The question that I'd like you to respond with here is um, really to rate your agreement on a Likert scale with the statement, learning data are valuable for improving student outcomes and student success. So you could rate this from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And in a moment, we'll share with you our results. Okay, here they come. I thought maybe this pattern would um, would come out. This is this being an Educause audience, after all. So um, there were twelve percent of us, six out of the fifty respondents, who strongly disagreed. I'm anticipating why you're going to say this in a moment, but um, most of us, sixty percent of respondents, thirty out of fifty, strongly agreed. The remaining twenty-two percent um, either agreed or neither agreed nor disagreed. So there's a pretty heavy slant in the direction of us agreeing that the learning data, which as Jason mentioned before, are gushing out of our systems, are valuable for improving student outcomes and student success. Um, let's go on to one more question that I think is gonna drive this home. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, Patty, and Jason, if you could bring up this next poll. So the statement I'd like you to rate your agreement with is, I have a clear understanding of how learning data can have a practical impact on student outcomes and student success. I want you to imagine yourself like if you agree with this, potentially even being called on in this webinar to articulate how this, um, how this impact can come from these learning data. Mm -hmm. 
I'll give it a few more seconds. The question I'd like you to be asking yourselves as we're about to see the results is, do you think there's gonna be less agreement with this statement? And sure enough, whereas previously 60% of us all strongly agreed that there's clear value for, of these learning data for improving student outcomes and student success, it seems to be the case that we're less um, <laughs> skewed and skewed positively in terms of our understanding of how we can do so. So that's really what today's talk is gonna be about, and that's to explore the methods for taking what's going on and what data are going into our learning systems and translating into some sort of value for understanding how we could improve student outcomes and student success. Patty, if you could go to the next slide, that is really the goal. So across all applications of education research and learning data utilization, and even to a some extent, like the institutions where we're, where we're appointed, I think that everybody has a consensus that a reasonable goal would be to understand and optimize student success in these environments. That understanding usually involves answering questions such as the, the ones that I've included here. So what classroom practices result in better outcomes? What instructional designs increase engagement? What materials improve performance? What interventions boost grades? What X causes Y? There's a template here. What thing could we do to improve the outcomes um, in our student population? And it's worth saying as a psychological scientist, it's well known that correlation and correlation analyses, correlational analyses, are not particularly well suited to answer these questions. We are swimming in this sea of data that you see in the background of the slide here, where we're surrounded really by data about what students are doing and what outcomes they might have. But the correlation analysis might only tell us that students who are successful tend to engage in certain patterns of activity. If we really wanna understand what works, what things an institution or a teacher or a success coach or an advisor could do to improve student success, the most compelling method is to conduct an experiment. So the question that I'm presenting to you today is how can digital learning platforms support experimental research? And I've got a solution for you. The solution is on the next slide. Drum roll, please. The solution is terracotta, or at least I should say one solution that I think we're excited to share with you is terracotta. Um, and today in the process of describing what work I have done and Anya and Patty, what we've done will be to kind of lay out for you how Terracotta provides a solution to this question of how the learning data can actually support student success and outcomes. If you go to the next slide, just to give you a heads up about who is all here today. My name is Ben Motes. Uh, as Jason said, I'm a research scientist at Indiana University. I direct the e-learning research and practice lab, and I'm also the person who's running Terracotta right now. Um, I'm joined, I'm so excited to be joined by Anya from the Learning Agency Lab. She'll be sharing a little bit more about the theoretical background and other activities that are going on as it relates to experimentation and learning environments. And Patty, who has been the mastermind from Unicon, who's been able to help us realize this vision of a tool that would actually make experimentation in student learning environments a possibility. So Anya, let me hand it off to you. Thanks, Ben, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, so we get the next slide. So the development of Terracotta was informed by learning engineering principles. So what exactly is learning engineering and how can we use it? To me, learning engineering is at the intersection of the learning sciences, data, and technology. Specifically, how can we use all three of those to propose tests and implement solutions that help to improve learning? We don't really know enough about how people learn. And so by testing theories, running experiments, using data, we can deepen our understanding of learning and take some of the guesswork out of education. So, can I have the next slide, thanks. Um, learning engineering can't happen in a bubble. We have to include teachers. In some of my work with teachers, I've heard that the idea of conducting research in the classroom can seem daunting. Some teachers feel like they don't know what to study. They may feel like they don't have enough time to run an experiment. But in many ways, teachers are already conducting experiments in their classroom all the time. So when a teacher tries a new intervention or you know, introduces a new learning platform to use with their students, if a teacher goes to a conference and hears about a new approach and then tries that out, every day teachers are studying their students, assessing their individual needs, and then adjusting their approach to meet those needs. And that cycle just continues over and over again. And that in itself is research. So if we can move towards 
formalizing that research, making tools and resources available so that teachers can run experiments easily and then also collect data on their students, it would be a powerful way to improve our understanding of learning. This was part of the idea of developing the teacher run experiment network, which we started at the lab. We started with some major goals. One was just to leverage the knowledge and expertise of the people who work most closely with students. A lot of educational research happens outside of the context of the classroom and context is so important and also without the involvement of teachers. So we wanted to you know, we, we want to see that changing and this program was sort of a pilot to see how we could do that. Secondly, we're, we were thinking about democratizing the research process, so expanding our ideas about who gets to ask the research questions, and also thinking about reducing the need to translate research findings from the academy to the classroom. If teachers are running small experiments in their classroom and collecting their own data, they can quickly act on their research findings, make changes, and then continue these small cycles of research as time goes on. Finally, we were interested in building teacher researcher communities. We can learn a lot from teachers and just from providing space for teachers to contribute to research communities. So how can we sort of just bring teachers in more? To give an overview of how the teacher run experiment the teacher run experiment network worked <laughs> was that we partnered with teach plus to help us recruit teachers they had to apply for the program but we didn't require any sort of research experience they just needed to have an interest in developing research skills and then a desire to contribute to the existing body of research we chose to support teachers in designing randomized control trials or rcts some did other kinds of studies, but we tried to steer them in the direction of RCTs, uh, just because it can be used to study just like the effect of a minor change. So a different explanation, you know, does that change how students understand what they're learning? We had a range of K through 12 teachers who taught different subjects and each teacher designed their own individual experiment. So for example, one teacher looked into autonomy and note-taking, his question was, does giving students agency and how they take notes affect how they in retain information? Um, you know, if you tell students they have to take notes in this specific format versus if you give them a range of options and let them take notes the way that they want to. Another teacher looked at student perceptions on race uh, and he actually was a biology teacher. So he was looking at if he taught about the biology of skin color, how does that affect a student's perception of race? Overall, the outcomes were great, even for teachers who got results where they saw no difference between their experimental and control groups. They still found it really valuable to have real data that told them I tried this thing and it actually didn't change anything. So maybe I'll try something else next time. For some teachers who tested out theories that they already had, running an experiment and having data confirmed those. One teacher looked at asynchronous versus synchronous instruction and how that affected learning. And students had three modes of instruction that they could, instruction that they could choose from. One was synchronous online instruction, one was synchronous in-person instruction, and the other was asynchronous self-paced. She suspected that synchronous instruction would be the most effective, but she was shocked by just how different the outcomes were for her asynchronous students versus her synchronous students. So the gaps were just much larger. She had one example of a student who had done all of his lessons self-paced and he scored 100% on all of the lessons. And then when he came into class and took a quiz, he scored a zero. When she sat down with him to go through the concepts, she realized that he actually just had no grasp on anything he had done online. So this is just one example, but we saw lots of results like this across the board. There were some challenges, especially running this program during COVID. I mean, we had so many teachers who had to change their experiments. Uh, it also just really highlighted the need for better technology and specifically like better technology around running experiments and collecting data on students. For most of the experiments that teachers ran, they used a combination of like Google Sheets and Google Forms. So it was very uh, DIY. Um, 
data collection. And we were really excited to partner with Ben as he was developing Terracotta because it's gonna support teachers in running these kinds of experiments and just make it way simpler across the board. Um, and he worked with some of the teachers in the network to run some user testing. So we're hopeful that as Terracotta develops, it can help to promote more rigorous classroom research and lower that barrier to entry for teachers specifically. So at the same time that the teacher run experiment or network, or I'm sorry, teacher run experiment network is experiencing the difficulty of getting teachers to create experiments in their classrooms, education researchers such as myself are doing exactly the same thing and experiencing exactly the same challenges. So what I have here are a few quotes of articles that I found especially, um, I don't know, compelling in terms of their ability to describe the challenges that a researcher might face in going out into an education setting and trying to randomly assign students to have different kinds of educational experiences. The requisite resources are generally far in excess of what most education researchers could hope to amass in the absence of considerable extramural funding. Consequently, it's also the case that people have observed that education researchers oftentimes elect to conduct more manageable, less ambitious, and less carefully controlled classroom-based investigations, such that the difficulty of running experiments in classrooms is sometimes an obstacle, not just to the method, but also to the rigor and the outcomes that might be um, necessary and also desperately needed from um, education research. Um, so this is something that I've uh, lived and experienced as a researcher. Um, my raison d'etre, in a sense, has been to try and overcome these barriers, to try and say, okay, if there's a burdensome amount of technical knowledge, how can we overcome that barrier so that people who don't have technical knowledge about how to program an experiment could nevertheless be able to execute one in their classes? If you go to the next slide. Some of my forays in this are much like what Anya said, like the DIY solution. So um, in 2015, if you could click to the next one, um, we tried running experiments with Qualtrics to some, to some success. Um, one of the challenges with Qualtrics was that it separated students from their um, place where they were actually doing their coursework, like in a classroom or in um, a teacher's website or something, and moved them into a survey platform that might have felt kind of strange to begin with. So um, while it got the job done, it definitely wasn't optimal in terms of giving students uh, actual educational experience. If we click to the next one, we also tried just building one ourselves using JavaScript. Um, same kind of problem though, that we found ourselves kind of building something that was artificial and that didn't quite have the feeling of being an education research platform. There are education, I'm sorry, I should say there are behavioral research platforms out there that do abstract some of these things. So if you click to the next one, we've explored using JS Psych, which is a platform for building web-based experiments and then administering them to students who are enrolled in classes. Still same problem, it's hard to really get that feeling of doing your coursework in the place where you'd normally do your coursework in a place where it's synthetic, where we've built something special just for a research experience. And we've done the obvious other thing as well. So in 2021, we recently published the Many Classes Study. And the Many Classes Study was wildly ambitious. It took an actual property of Canvas and manipulated the property of the Canvas learning management system for different types of students. But what we had to do to get that done was to actually manually, one by one, click on each individual student and drag them into different sections within the Canvas learning management system. And with over 3,000 students in the study, it was absurd. It's, it's manual work that nobody should ever have to do again. Um, what we really need is a better solution. So with Patty and with my partnership with Anya, we have put together Terracotta. If you go to the next slide, Terracotta is really the thing that solves this. What we need from Terracotta is we need experimentation to be easier so that it can be more common, so that it's not the case that somebody has to go through all these different technologies to be able to get an experiment done. Also, so that we can then have bigger impacts that go outside the scope of what might be convenient to be able to run. To be run. Another interesting property of um, difficulties of running experiments is that um, if you're running an experiment only in the place where it's convenient or where you have the technical know-how to get something done, then you wind up really biasing the results toward a particular type of population. By making experimentation easier, by building a platform that can support experimentation at scale, and then we can also inherently make experimentation more diverse. So we can include um, participant populations that would otherwise be excluded from the conveniences of where it's easy to run experiments. Okay, Terracotta gets this job done. Sorry, I have my slides switched. So, um, Terracotta is actually a portmanteau, not an acronym. It's a portmanteau for tool for education research with randomized control trials. And the basic idea is that it's an experiment builder in the learning management system. 
that achieves a number of different features. And the feature list is growing kind of as the hour goes by nowadays. Um, first, it creates different variations of a single learning management system assignment. It does the simplest thing that you'd want to do in an experiment, where you take what you assign to a student and make it so that it's differentiated for different experimental conditions. So some students get one kind of a condition, other students get another condition, and those amount to different experiences of an assignment. You randomly assign students to these different versions. It also enables within subject crossovers. This is worth kind of like stopping and highlighting for a moment because to the extent that there's any concern about the ethics of experimentation, my guess is that within subject crossovers solves that. In a between subject experiment, where we say you students over here get one condition, you students over here get another condition, it might be the case that condition A is better than condition B. And thus, students who got condition A might be, I don't know, getting some advantage that students in condition B didn't get. If we do it within subject crossover, then what happens is all students get all conditions, just different times of the semester. So some students get A then B, other students get B then A, and then halfway through the semester it switches. So in this way, we equate what the experimental treatment is across students so that we don't have any sort of possibility of bias. Terracotta also incorporates grades from the LMS as experiment outcomes. So if you wanna know how the assignment affected performance on the final exam, Terracotta allows you to pull those final exam scores into the experiment to measure as outcomes of the experiment. It also does additional protections for students. So for one, it collects informed consent. Um, anybody who's ever run an experiment in a classroom knows that consent can be a tricky process because the teacher is in a position of authority. They might actually coerce students into consenting against their wishes. By running informed consent in Terracotta, we kind of eliminate that issue. Students can respond to the informed consent question without having any sort of concern for whether the teacher will know what their response is. And it also, if somebody doesn't consent, takes them out of the experiment. So it, we're, we allow the teacher or the researcher to export data from the experiment that's de-identified and that only includes people who consented to participate if consent is applied. So I wanna go to a next slide. Everything that I talked about, or, or, sorry, our, our next poll, everything that I talked about so far is um, kind of interesting in that it describes the process of getting tools for analytics, for using data into the hands of teachers. Um, that might not always be how it is nowadays. So I'm curious to ask right now, who on your campus has the most access to students learning data? I'll ask you to make a single choice. Who's the, who's the unit that actually has the most access to students learning data? or role or individual. Give it a couple more seconds here. Okay, so maybe it's just the Educause audience again, but yeah, this is kind of what one might have guessed that for the most part, the learning data that we're talking about is sequestered in IT. So it's the case that IT units have access to the students learning data, but they're not necessarily the people who are especially poised to do something with it. Those are the teachers. And there seems to be a gap. There's a gap in terms of data access and to the extent that we might wanna build a tool that gives instructors access to student learning data, there's a number of different integrations that need to take place. So there's basically a bridge that needs to be made between the learning activity and the people who would potentially be able to do something with the data, the teachers. And um, to kind of explain that and how Terracotta solves that angle, I'm gonna turn it over to Pat. Great, thanks, Ben. Um, so you know, kind of had the opportunity to partner with IU to design and build Terracotta and really address some of the challenges that Ben had identified earlier in the presentation with respect to some of the technology challenges that we were working to overcome. So we partnered with IU to build an application that's based on standards, interoperability, to prepare for expansion and growth. Uh, this is one of Unicon's specialties. Uh, we work with our clients to collect, normalize, and visualize data. Uh, we want our customers to get more out of the data signal signals they're collecting today and help them identify and generate new data signals. Um, with Terracotta, uh, we built it. It is an open source application based on the Apache 2.0 open source license. 
Um, we've incorporated interoperability using IMS standards such as Caliper, um, LTI 1.3 are built into the application. Right now it is integrated with Canvas and, and Ben will um, demonstrate that as part of, his, part of his demo of Terracotta. Um, and then it is also built on top of an AWS infrastructure. And with this application, one of the key things, as, as both Ben and Anya alluded to, is we really wanted to make sure that we empowered teachers um, and students to learn from expertise in the classroom and push data collection and review down to that lowest level on campus. Um, so if we look at our project approach, um, our, our effort with the POC that was going to be demonstrated today, it was a quick three months. Um, from uh, project initiation all the way to development and release of the final um, POC. Uh, we partnered with Ben and his team to understand what that product vision was. Um, we worked off a base of wireframes and then created that into working software. Um, we collected a team of resources um, on the Unicon side that included backend developers, front end developers, um, QA. Uh, experts to go through and, and through the various um, seven short sprints uh, that we went through uh, to develop the POC today. Um, those that folks that are on the phone from an IT perspective, uh, Terracotta is a Java based backend view front end technology. And then I'll turn it over to you for a demo. Yeah, you guys want to see it? Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, a couple nights ago, I was thinking about what kind of experiment to share, and I figured that something that is hot off the press would be especially useful, um, just as an example of like its nimble ability to run different types of experiments. So I looked up the Journal of Applied Research in Memory and Cognition, one of my favorites, JARMAC. I don't know if any of you follow JARMAC, but um, on September 17th, a pretty cool article came out by Sarah Tauber. Um, How does the type of expected evaluation impact students' self-regulated learning? So I read the article and I've implemented a version of it. It's definitely not as Sarah might have, but it gets the job done for showing you how something might actually work in Terracotta. I've got here a test course in Canvas and we've got Terracotta integrated in the left navigation menu. And if I click on it, it opens up in a new window right now and I can click on this expected evaluation experiment that I've put together. I'm not gonna show you the process of building an experiment. My guess is that there aren't very many experimenters yet in the room, um, but instead uh, I want you to trust me that there's a relatively detailed experiment builder setup. It's actually modeled on um, the evidence to insight coach that would take a, a teacher or a researcher through a sequence of design decisions that would ultimately arrive at an experiment setup as we've got one now. So um, after having gone through that builder process, I've got a design setup. This is the title of the experiment, expected evaluation experiment. And we've got two different conditions. This is the key thing to kind of highlight about Sarah Talbert's work. When you're about to do an activity, a learning activity, you could be told that that learning activity is going to be beneficial to your performance on, I don't know, the final exam. And let's say the final exam is a multiple choice test. So this is not very socially demanding. Like you would be evaluated on your learning from an activity just by your own individual performance bubbling in a multiple choice exam. Alternatively, you could be told that that learning experience that you're about to engage in is gonna help you prepare for a very socially demanding evaluation. So for example, maybe you're going to give a group presentation at the end of the semester and the learning activity that you're about to engage in is gonna be a part of what you're going to have to teach to your peers. So this would be a very socially demanding evaluation that would be downstream from the learning activity. In both situations, the um, learning activity is the same. The real difference is whether somebody expects that they'll be evaluated on their learning from that activity in a socially demanding way or in a not socially demanding way. In Terracotta, what you can do is you can set up one of these conditions as being the default. That default treatment is what somebody would experience if it was kind of business as usual. And what actually happens behind the scenes is that students who don't consent to participate in an experiment will be assigned to that default condition. So they, they're not randomly assigned to anything. This is kind of what we would consider business as usual, but that's not the control condition because students who don't participate or who don't consent to participate are excluded from any data already. We can set up things as a within subject design or as a between subject design. As I told you, within subject crossovers can have ethical benefits, but today, just to make things simple, I've set it up as a um, between subject design. So everybody only gets one treatment. 
the participants become participants by um, filling out an informed consent statement. I'm sorry, not by filling, they'll, they'll read the informed consent statement and then click to agree or not agree to consent to participate. And this experiment that I've put together has one assignment, which we're just calling self-based learning activity. And it has two different versions, either a socially demanding version or a non-socially demanding version, the default. And here's what one could edit these and play around. I've got one student in this course site and um, that student happens to be me. I've already given my consent um, um, oh, there's also the test student. Um, and I'll show you now what it's like from a student's perspective to participate in the self-paced learning activity after having been randomly assigned to one of these different conditions. Um, so here I'm logged in in this window as a student. Um, so I'm gonna go back to that test course. And if we go to assignments, you can see that I've got the um, consent assignment. So like expected evaluation consent. This is where one, if I click on it, this is where one would consent to participate or not participate. I'm not going to click because I already did it. But if I go back to assignments, um, you can see that I've also got the self-paced learning activity, which is the actual experiment treatment. If I click on that, okay, you can see the framing statement, which again is the core aspect of this experiment whether somebody will be in a socially demanding evaluation setting or in a not socially demanding evaluation setting. And in this particular case, my student role has been assigned to the socially demanding uh, condition. So it says topics that you encounter in this learning activity will be part of the presentation that you will give to your classmates at the end of the semester to perform well during this presentation and so on and so forth. So I can say, I acknowledge that I will keep presenting on these topics. And as a framing thing, it might not be the case that you want this to have any points. So we can assign a question to have some variable number of points. In this case, it can be worthless toward the actual grade. And then you could go on with any sort of um, questions that you might want to include in a learning activity. In this case, the hip bone is connected to the thigh bone. So I'm gonna submit this. It says, yes, I'm ready to submit. And now it'll be graded just as a normal multiple choice question in a Canvas Learning uh, Management System quiz would be like. And that's really a big accomplishment. Like again, going back to the slide that I showed you, like, hey, I've tried this in Qualtrics, I've tried this with JavaScript, I've tried this with JS Psych. It's a major coup that we can actually run an experiment in the environment where a student would otherwise be performing and taking and like working through learning activities without having to separate them from go, going into some sort of like a laboratory environment or some synthetic place where they might not be as familiar. Okay, so my answers have been submitted. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to my um, window where I'm the teacher here, I'm gonna refresh. And you can see that if I go back to status, we've now got a, a submission for the self-paced learning activity. If this was the case that we had like open-ended response questions, one could grade those responses here. So we would actually be able to click on the notes and um, yeah, grade what somebody's responses might've been and update scores accordingly. Um, the important aspect of running an experiment is not necessarily just like setting up the thing, although that is a critical aspect. The hard part is to then analyze the data that one generates and a spectacular amount of data has just been generated by me just going through and clicking um, in that particular assignment. So um, a core feature of Terracotta is that it allows the export of these data. So I just clicked on the export data button and it's downloaded to my downloads folder, a zip file that contains a number of different CSVs. The CSVs are at this point, something that basically we took the, we, we adopted the approach that we're gonna give all the data to a potential researcher rather than kind of cherry pick it. Although in the not too distant future in Terracotta's development plan, we'll actually make a dashboard that would make it possible for somebody to at a glance be able to see which condition might've worked better for outcome measures. Um, so in, these, in this sequence, you could see student submissions. I'll open up um, just so that you get the idea. These themselves are de-identified. It's not the case that there's any identifiable information in the exports. And again, it only includes um, the responses of students who've provided consent. So the test student would not be included here because the test student didn't give consent. Um, if you just wanna see what it looks like as the test student, I wouldn't blame you because um, the test student will be assigned to the other treatment condition. So just as an example of what of the fact that there actually is random assignment going on behind the scenes. If I enter in the test student view and then click on assignments and then go to the same learning activity, here I'm being given the default treatment because I wasn't, um, I didn't provide consent. Here it just says topics that you encountered in this learning activity will be included in the course's final exam. So that's the basic idea. By now you've seen that we can randomly assign different students to different conditions using Terracotta and also students experience those different conditions. And, de-identified data from this experiment can be exported. Now that I've walked through that process, 
absurdly quickly. <laughs> I'm going to hand it back to Patty to bring us all back together and stop sharing. Great. And so, Ben, um, the chat is blowing up. <laughs> Might want to take a few minutes before we go to the next slide talking about um, next steps to just answer some of the questions in the chat. I think I've captured all of them and I can just read them if, if you and Anya can help answer. Um, and, and some of them are comments too. So from Paul, something that's concerning is the lack of access for senior leaders who have the scope of authority to implement and assist change based on that data. I'm sympathetic. In fact, I spend most of my time in conversations with people who you might consider to be senior leaders at Indiana University and elsewhere. And I think that one of the interesting properties of Terracotta is that it actually makes this uh, a viable thing, not just within the confines of a single class, but also at the level of like large scale collaborations that senior leaders might be interested in testing out. One of the most good things about an experiment is that the results of an experiment are especially compelling in terms of providing evidence that something works. So to the extent that uh, the leadership, whether it's academic leadership or IT leadership or wherever, wherever you might find this. Um, one of the cool things about Terracotta is that it enables collaborations where we could all kind of get together to try different things at scale. So that's one of the one of the things that I see as being a potentially fruitful avenue for Terracotta is not just individual experiments in one class, but collaborations across classes where people come together to try what works. Great. Thanks, Ben. Another question from Megan. Um, can the panelists address how terracotta can be used to run experiments that might be predictive of student behavior performance? Ooh. So experimentation is usually different from prediction. Like experimentation involves answering a question about what the mechanism is that causes something. A prediction might be, um, yeah, agnostic to what that mechanism might be. Nevertheless, I, if, what, if what you're saying is, let's say we might have a prediction of a student having some outcome, and what we want to do is we want to make um, an experimental treatment contingent on what we might already know about uh, a student, that is also possible. What we've done in this study is we've randomly assigned students to different treatment conditions. Something else that we could do is we could actually control that. We could um, manually assign students to different treatment conditions, depending on what we already know about them. So it's possible to manually say, you student, you get the socially demanding, you student get the not socially demanding, so that we can maybe stratify by different propensity scores or do other things. So in a sense, it allows us to do the sorts of things where we might imagine treatments based on what we know about a student. But yeah, it's not the sort of thing that is aimed at making um, a theoretic predictions. Instead, it's aimed at making explanatory predictions about what should work given a particular treatment. Great. Um, another kind of comment from Michael, access is slippery. Instructors often have access to a lot of learning data from their students, but not necessarily in a useful form and not generally with training or guidance on how to use it. So I'm actually kind of sympathetic to this and it's something that I trouble with a lot. Um, right now, as I showed you, Terracotta spits out a number of different CSV files and instructors have potentially varying degrees of expertise with respect to how they, should, how they could work with these data. Um, the, so Terracotta right now is not a solution to upskill instructors. Terracotta is a solution to lower ba uh, the barriers for somebody who might already be relatively well-versed or might be interested in collaborating with others. There are some features that we're, we're planning. Like I said, there's a dashboard that we try to imagine ourselves um, making the process a little bit more accessible to non-experimenters. But I think that the first step, in, at least as we've imagined Terracotta, is to, be, to eliminate the practical barriers. And yeah, we can imagine ourselves maybe building training or PD or some other features that make it more accessible in the future. Um, another comment, and, and we can definitely get back to this, is just making sure that we post the article citations um, in the chat for future res reference by the participants. So we can definitely do that. Um, Patricia asked a question on uh, the type of technology that was used in the front end and back end. I did address this in the chat. So it is a Java-based back end with a view front end um, is what we use to develop Terracotta. Um, another comment here from Michael, I'd love to see the experimental design filter. What was the name of the thing it was modeled after again? E2i coach. Um, yeah, it's that's, I'll put it into chat. Um, the E2i coach is, 
it comes out of um, the US Department of Education actually. And it's impressive. It, it guides somebody who's about to do a research through all the design decisions that would allow them to arrive at an experiment. Um, if you wanna just get quickly a glimpse of what it looks like in terracotta, I can do that too. Um, so let me share my screen very briefly. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna torture you by actually building an experiment, but because Michael asked, um, let's go back, let's leave our student view. Let's go back to terracotta. And I'll go back to the experiment and basically I'll start at the beginning of the experiment. You can see that there's a builder that has a left navigation kind of guide as to where you're at. Um, questions allow somebody to kind of work through title and description, basic metadata, building the conditions. There could be many conditions if somebody wanted to have, you know, a full factorial thing that has 24 cells, it's totally good. And then, yeah, as we get toward decisions that are actually practical with the design, then there's tool tips that come up about what those decisions actually mean in the context of the, of the design of the experiment. So yeah, this is very similar to what E2I does. Um, let's see where we are from the questions. Um, can I collect demographic and related data from a student that's not scored in the LMS or available to me um, via the SIS, such, such as race, ethnicity, and SES? That is a solid question. Who asked that question? Megan. Megan's Megan. Megan. Good job. Um, yeah. So Terracotta would allow you to do that. One thing you could do is you could just ask students. So you could include in your experiment an assignment that has all the questions that you'd want them to answer. You could make the assignment worth something or you could make it worth nothing. And just like a learning activity, students would be like the student work through that assignment would be included in the exports. Alternatively, if you know something about a student that might be a property of the student that you want to be included outside of like asking the student for that input, you could also include that as an outcome I know that sounds crazy to have like a demographic property be an outcome, but it works as far as like the data are concerned. So I'll show you this in Terracotta 2. This is our, our current solution to the problem. Um, share my screen. I should just keep it on my sharing. So um, Zoom is covering up. If I go back here and go to save and exit, let's go back to expected evaluation. Um, if I go to status exposure, I can add outcomes and I could either select these outcomes from the gradebook. So as I said before, an outcome could be the final exam, but I could also manually enter scores for each individual student. So let's say that this question was like, I don't know, um, high school percentile. Let's include that as a potential outcome score. And I would give to each student a number that would be then included in the export. And the reason that you do that, as opposed to just kind of rely on what data your institution already has, is that as long as you put those scores or whatever the demographic properties that you're interested in into Terracotta, it'll export it in a de-identified way that excludes non-consenting participants. So you get the benefits of having the workflow that ensures privacy while still kind of including the data that you might otherwise want to inject into the experiment analysis. Did that, did that make sense? It was a great question. Right. Another question from Simon. When students know they're part of an experiment, does it affect their performance? Instructors do not need permission to experiment in their own classes. Perhaps it's better for students not to know. They may blame the grade on the experiment. It's true. Yeah. So there are expectancy effects. It's, it's, a, it's not something that I can say doesn't exist. The, the balancing act that any teacher or researcher will have to play is how to design a research study that both honors the student's rights to things like respect for persons, beneficence, all that, and also the teacher, the researcher's rights to be able to learn what works. In some cases, it might be the case that the experimental treatment is so innocuous or so minor or so uh, harmless that Informed consent is a non-issue, like you could just skip it. And Terracotta does allow that to be the case. Another practical case where you'd wanna skip informed consent is if you're in a grade school. So K-12 might not actually have the concept of informed consent be applicable at all because nobody's adults. So it might be the case that the principal or the school board gives you permission to run an experiment. In both cases, you wouldn't wanna use consent. And in that situation, it's possible to skip it. 
Terracotta does have some warning screens. It says like, are you sure you want to do it? Consent can be a good thing, but it's possible to, to not have it. Anya, did you want to comment on that? Oh yeah, I was just going to jump in and say, uh, for the teachers that were running experiments, they were all K-12. So we got informed consent from the parents usually, uh, but also uh, in some cases, teachers set up experiments where both groups get both treatments just in a different order. And so it sort of like minimizes that, you know, oh, I got one treatment and somebody else didn't and maybe my grade is messed up because of the way you taught me this. And it's worth kind of adding that the thing that Anya just mentioned where you've got parental permission slips also is implemented in Terracotta. So thanks to working with Anya as we were developing it. Um, there's also a feature where, for example, a teacher gets permission slips, they can manually mark which students are and aren't participating. Again, it's not informed consent, it's not blanket approval, it's that the teacher knows who is and who isn't participating and then Terracotta filters out people who are not. There are also, just one more quick thing, there are also ways, we had so many issues with like trying to truly randomize um, experiments this year, but one way that some teachers got around this as well was if they had different cohorts of classes, they would randomize the uh, specific cohort as, a, as opposed to doing it like within the class. So, and in some cases, it just wasn't possible. For example, with the note-taking experiment, there was just no way for him to tell some of his students that they could take notes only in one way and then other students could without them knowing that he was studying them. So, yeah. All right. Um, so another question then, would it matter to the experiment design if the students knew about and compared being in one group versus the other for the experiment? experiment? If I knew I was in the non-social evaluation and someone else was in the social ev evaluation, for example. So yeah. Students will communicate with one another. Um, this is something that we've experienced in just about every research study that I've um, con conducted. So um, we call that treatment spillage. In the, in the business, we call it treatment spillage. And the, so there is a modicum of bias that you get, or I should actually say what the effect of treatment spillage is, is that the effect, whatever the difference is that you're trying to measure, becomes smaller. So it becomes basically harder to detect a difference if students from one condition know what the students in the other condition might, might, have, get, might have gotten. It reduces the sort of the dosage or the intensity of the experimental treatment. But what you get from being able to run an experiment that's at the individual level, as opposed to cluster randomized trials, like saying this class gets one treatment, this class gets another treatment, is that you get statistical power. So by doing individually randomized trials, then the unit of analysis is the student. And there are many more students than there are classes. There might still be reasons if you've got like a, particu a particularly um, interesting contrast that you really wouldn't want students from different um, treatment conditions to know about the other, then maybe it would be better as a between site study where you've got, yeah, one class doing one thing, another class doing another thing. Although students sometimes talk between classes too, so it becomes difficult. In general, I think that education researchers are falling down on the idea that individual-based randomization, even though there's such a thing as treatment spillage, is usually the best way to go for showing a difference. All right, great. So another question, Ben, can data be linked across multiple courses from one semester to the next to perform a more long-term study? So the data are the teachers or the researcher who's collaborating with the teacher. Like the, the data will be exported and it'll be exported in a common format. So um, basically like doing a row bind where you take some data from one semester and bind it onto the other should be possible. Um, yeah, we're working on functionality in Terracotta right now that allows one to basically export an experiment as designed in one class and squirt it into another Canvas course site so that one could easily iterate or even distribute an experiment across multiple course sections or across multiple semesters. Um, there's, yeah, so there's, there's nothing practical that's preventing that. It's more of a, we're trying to make it a little bit easier in the near future. All right, another question. Um, how does Terracotta support ethical research practices given that teachers are not researchers that may not know or ascribe to the ethical research practices that guide professional researchers. Researchers have to go through ethics training and pass certifications to, to conduct research. Yeah. 
I'm going to answer that question by saying that the university, by making somebody a teacher, is putting a crap ton of trust in that person. So everything from FERPA to grade assignment relies on a teacher behaving ethically. And I think that that trust could extend to trusting that they wouldn't do an experiment unethically. That might be, I mean, your question kind of scratches at a larger issue of how we can help a generation of teachers to become um, capable experimenters using tools like Terracotta, but other tools are out. And I think that that's a process that will require collaboration. And the biggest obstacle to that collaboration right now is practical. So we're eliminating the practical um, problem, although I still think that you're right that there's work to do to build these collaborations. Some of that work is being done actively right now. So I can spotlight a collaborator of mine, Mark McDaniel at Washington University runs um, Circle. So it's a center that is a collaboration between teachers and cognitive scientists who are interested in exploring um, cognitive interventions and how they improve student outcomes in learning environments, just like this. Um, so yeah, there's currently efforts underway to try and basically upskill teachers so that they're capable contributors in this enterprise of finding out what works. Great. Um, a few more questions. Uh, so with Terracotta in development, is there a projection as to when it might be commercially available? Do you want to show the last slide? I mean, we could kind of- Yeah, like, we can absolutely do that. Know. Let's share the last slide. Can everyone see so, my... Yeah, okay. yeah it looks good. Um, if this is something that you're interested in, it's worth kind of spotlighting what Patty said early. It's, it's open source. So um, if you want to go to terracotta.education um, and you could include I want terracotta or it happens to be the first post that's in our, in our, um, in our role right now. Um, yeah, you could see a link to our GitHub repo and there's instructions um, that Patty's team have prepared for somebody who wanted to spin up their own terracotta instance. So it's something that you could totally do right now as you wish. Um, on our end, we're still working on ways of making it so that it's um, both sustainable and available perhaps as a service. One of the big things that have made this possible is that um, Terracotta has recently been announced as the recipient of a IES grant, Institute of Education Sciences, now has a digital learning platforms to enable efficient education research network. That has gotta be the longest named research network in the history of research networks. But um, yeah, we're expecting a stable beta release sometime this coming summer. And if you're interested to find ways of having us maybe like include you in a multi-tenant architecture as a service, then in the I Want Terracotta page up there, there's a form that you could fill out. We'd be happy to circle back with you and find ways of making it possible for you to get a pilot at your, at your place. In addition, we're also working on the XPRIZE Digital Learning Challenge. So this is still open and we're putting together an entry. The entry will be to run a multi-site experimental research pilot within Terracotta. And yeah, this is another area that we're interested in building out features so that we can expand the scope of what's possible within Terracotta to accommodate new research, uh, new research methods that are relevant to that particular prize. So yeah, so if you're interested in it, then yeah, go to terracotta.education in that first post, you'll find a link to our GitHub. And if you're interested in following up, then let us know. We'd be happy to have another webinar with you and your team. So probably have time for another question or two before we need to wrap. This next question is for you, Anya. So a question popped into my head during Anya's presentation. She presented data that an online asynchronous self-paced activity was inferior to both live online and live face-to-face -face te teaching. As this runs counter to most existing research, the factors involving the experiment design, rigor, et cetera, are concerning. Decisions made based on the result of less rigorously designed experimentation or instruction. Yeah, so you're completely right. And with all of the studies that teachers ran, these were all like very small scale, as I explained, sort of DIY experiments just to provide them with some insights on their instruction and like the context of her students. I think another teacher could have done this experiment with their students somewhere else and had completely different results. I think for her, it just gave her information that she needed to shift the way that she structured her asynchronous instruction so that it was more effective for her students. She was also working with younger students, so that could affect it, but we aren't, it, 
we aren't promoting like basing or saying like, you know, synchronous instruction over asynchronous instruction from this like very small scale study. It's more just providing feedback. And of course she would need to do more studies on her students to see if, you know, if it's even true, you know, she ran one study that is not enough information to base a decision on. So yeah, I can, I completely agree. It was just interesting for her instruction. Although I do want to say like, sometimes the sample for an exper an education research experiment is a population. So um, yeah, it might be the case that the full, the full totality of everybody who you'd be interested to study are only the students in one class. And if that's the case, then it might be the case that the number of students who are enrolled in that class is 100% of everybody who you care about. And if that's true, then yeah, the sample size is, is not an issue because you're finding out what works exactly for whom you're interested in. If you don't want to make an inference to some new population, then studying within a class is ample. Maybe time for one or two more questions, Ben. Um, how valid are these experiments if groups are small? Perhaps experimenting one class versus another helps to also include learning community in class as support, making it more like class experiments. Well, so kind of like I said before, it depends on what you're going to do with the data. So um, yeah, there is, it's not the case that there's one sample size that is the right sample size for an experiment. You really have to think about what the inference is that you're trying to draw. Are you trying to draw an inference about all of education? If so, then you need like many different kinds of classes. So the generalizability of the inference that's being targeted with an experiment is really critical for understanding how to structure the experiment itself. I'm kind of like very concerned about this in education research. So yeah, the generalizability crisis is a recent article that came out um, as a preprint in behavioral and brain sciences. And it suggests that almost all of social, ex social science is uh, experiencing a crisis of generalizability. So yeah, I do think that researchers need to be especially careful about the distance of their inferences drawn from an experiment. But again, it shouldn't be the case that because somebody has a small sample size, they can't learn something important, especially if it's a question that's being, you know, that's relevant to a particular teacher's practice. And yeah, that's, that's something for which I think that the results of an experiment in just that teacher's class would be really strong evidence. Yeah. Okay, we're at the last slide. Patty, did we, did we actually talk about like, who would present the last slide? Um, I don't think so. We just wanted to make sure that folks had our contact information. So um, great. We really appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, here are our email address for the panelists that were here today. Um, Jason, I think you have some closing words. Yes, definitely. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. What an engaging presentation, really exciting content and conversation. Uh, before you sign off today, please click on the session evaluation link. You'll find that in the chat window. Your comments are extremely important to us. The session's recording and presentation slides will be posted to the website later today. Uh, and please feel free to share that with your colleagues. And finally, please join us for the next industry and campus webinar on October 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern to hear about securing digital transformation in higher ed. Um, on behalf of Educause, thank you so much to all of our presenters. And this is Jason Martin. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jason. Thanks to everybody. Thank you, yep. thank you everyone, for joining us.